purpose of this screencast is to read the story Lobs Girl by Joan Aiken. Before we actually start reading, I want you to think about the quality we went over in class together, that of loyalty. See how that shows up in this story. Second, I want you to think about the literary device of foreshadowing. The author often uses foreshadowing to tell key parts of the story or to prepare the reader for things that are going to happen. Third, I want you to think about again and again the signpost where you would stop, note, and notice events that continue to happen again and again. And what is the importance of those? Why did the author include them? So, in your possession you have a handout that looks like this. It gives you a definition of again and again. Events, images, or particular words that recur over a portion of the novel. A word is repeated, sometimes used in an odd way, over and over in the story, or an image reappears several times during the course of the book. There's an event in Lob's Girl that happens again and again. We'll make note of those and stop and think about them. When you come across these again and again moments, stop and notice and note. When you're reading and a word is repeated or an image reappears several times, you should stop and ask yourself, why might the author bring this up again and again? We're going to do that. And why do you ask this question? Well, when you see repetition in a novel, you can bet it's important, but you might not know right away what it means. You won't know right away what it means in Lob's Girl. But repetition helps develop a symbol that will lead us to, under to understanding one of the story's themes. And that's definitely the key here, is the story's theme may come out in this again and again moment. So up here it says, read from page 88 to line 140 on page 93 of the story Lob's Girl and stop. We're going to do that together, then we're going to stop and answer number one and number two. Then we're going to complete the story. After completing the story, we'll come to three, four, five, and these processing questions on the back. So, we're going to start on page 88 and read to line 140 on page 93. Lob's Girl by Joan Aiken. Some people choose their dogs, and some do dogs choose their people. The Pengeli family had no say in the choosing of Lob. He came to them in the second way, and very decisively. It began on, a be on the beach, the summer when Sandy was five. Don, her older brother, twelve, and the twins were three. Sandy was really Alexandra, because her grandmother had a beautiful picture of a queen in a diamond tiara and a high collar of pearls. It hung by Granny Pierce's kitchen sink and was, a familiar, and, and was as familiar as the doormat. When Sandy was born, everyone agreed that she was the living spit of the picture, and so she was called Alexandra and Sandy for short. On this summer day, she was lying peacefully reading a comic and not keeping an eye on the twins, who didn't need it because they were occupied in seeing which of them could wrap the most seaweed around the other's one, other one's leg. Father, Bert Pingelli, and Don were up on the hard painting up on the hard, painting the bottom boards of the boat in which father was fishing for pilchards. And mother, Jean Pingelli, was getting ahead with making the Christmas puddings because she never felt easy in her mind if they weren't made and safely put away by the end of August. As usual, each member of the family was happily getting on with his or her own affairs. Little did they guess how soon this state of things would be changed by the large new member who was going to erupt into their midst. So I want to look back at some vocab here. A hard is a landing place for boats. Pilchards are small uh, fish similar to sardines. And the living spit means like the person is a likeness. 
All right. Sandy rolled onto her back to make sure that the twins were not climbing on the slippery rocks or getting cut off by the tide. At the same moment, a large body struck her forcibly in the midriff. It's like her abdomen. And she was covered by flying sand. Instinctively, she shut her eyes and felt the sand being wiped off her face by something that seemed like a warm, rough, damp flannel. She opened her eyes and looked. It was a tongue. Its owner was a large and bouncy young Alsian, or German shepherd, with topaz eyes, black tipped prick ears, and a thick, soft coat, and a bushy, black tipped tail. Lob! shouted a man farther, farther up the beach. Lob, come here! But Lob, as if trying to atone for the surprise he had given her, went on licking the sand off Sandy's face, wagging his tail so hard while he kept on knocking up more clouds of sand. His owner, a gray-haired man with a limp, walked over and quickly as he could, walked over as quickly as he could and seized him by the collar. I hope he didn't give you a fright, the man said to Sandy. He might, he, he meant it in play. He's only young. Here we can see Lob on the beach. Oh, I think he's beautiful, said Sandy truly. She picked up a bit of driftwood and threw it. Lob, whisking easily out of his master's grip, was after it like a sand-colored bullet. Like a sand-colored bullet. He came back with the stick, beaming, and gave it to Sandy. At the same time, he gave himself, though no one else was aware of this at the time. But with Sandy, too, it was love at first sight. And when, after a lot more stick-throwing, she had the twins join, join Father and Don to go home for tea, they cast many backward glance at Lob, being led firmly away by his master. I wish we could play with him every day, Tess sighed. Why can't we, said Tim. Sandy explained, because Mr. Dodsworth, who owns him, is from Liverpool, and he is only staying at the Fisherman's Arms till Saturday. So it gives us a look here. Liverpool in England is here. And apparently they live in Cornwall, which is down here. So it's a long ways away. And if we look at this, it's over 100 miles. That's something to keep in mind. Right at the corner end of England from Cornwall, I'm afraid. It was a, corn, it was a Cornish fishing village where the Pingelli family lived, with rocks and cliffs and a strip of beach and a little round harbor, and palm trees growing in the gardens of the little whitewashed stone houses. The village was approached by a narrow, steep, and twisting hill road, and guarded by a notice that said, low gear for one and a half miles, dangerous to cyclists. Let's stop here for a moment. Reread the sentence in lines 54 to 56. How might this be an example of foreshadowing? So it says, The village was approached by a narrow, steep, twisting hill road and guarded by a notice that said low gear for one and a half miles. Dangerous to cyclists. Think in your head. Make a prediction. What might that foreshadow? The Pingelli children went home to scones with Cornish cream and jam thinking they had seen the last of Lob, but they were much mistaken. The whole family was playing cards by the fire in the front room after supper when there was a loud thump and a crash of china in the kitchen. My Christmas puddings, exclaimed Jean, and ran out. Did you put tea and tea in them then, her husband said. But it was Lob, who, finding the front door shut, had gone around to the back and bounced in through the open kitchen window, where the puddings were cooling on the sill. Luckily, only the smallest was knocked down and broken. Lob stood on his hind legs and plastered Sandy's face with licks. Then he did the same for the twins, who shrieked with joy. Where does, his friend of, where does this friend of yours come from? inquired Mr. Pingelli. He's staying at the fisherman's arms. I mean, his owner is. Then he must go back there. Find a bit of string. Sandy, 
to tie his collar. I wonder how he found his way here, Miss, Mrs. Pengelly said, when the reluctant lob had been led whining away and Sandy had explained about the, uh, their afternoon's game on the beach. Fisherman's Arms is right around the other side of the harbor. Lob's owner scolded him and thanked Mr. Pengelly for bringing him back. Jean Pengelly warned the children that they had better not encourage Lob any more if they met him on the beach, or it would only lead to more trouble. So they dutifully took no notice of him the next day until he spoiled their good resolutions by dashing up to them with joyful barks, wagging his tail so hard that he winded Tess and knocked Tim's legs from under him. They had a happy day playing on the sand. The next day was Saturday. Sandy had found out that Mr. Dodsworth was to catch the half-past nine train. He went out secretly down to the station, nodded to Mr. Hoskins, the station master, who wouldn't dream of charging any local for a platform ticket, and climbed up on the footbridge that led, on, that led over the tracks. She didn't want to be seen. But she did want to see. She saw Mr. Dodsworth get on the train, accompanied by an unhappy-looking lob with drooping ears and a tail. Then she saw the train slide away, out of sight, around the next he uh, headland, with a melancholy wail that sounded like Lob's last goodbye. Melancholy means gloomy. Sandy wished she hadn't had the idea of coming to the station. She walked home miserably with her shoulders hunched and her hands in her pockets. For the rest of the day, she was so cross and unlike herself that Tess and Tim were quite surprised, and her mother gave her a dose of senna. If you look at what senna is, it's medicine made from leaves. So they think she's feeling gloomy, so they gave her medicine. A week passed. Then, one evening, Mrs. Pengelly and the younger children were in the front room of front room playing snakes and ladders. Mr. Pingelli and Don had gone fishing on the evening tide. If your father is a fisherman, he will never be home at the same time from one week to the next. Suddenly, history repeating itself, there was a crash from the kitchen. Jean Pingelli leaped up, <clears throat> crying, My blackberry jelly! <clears throat> she and the children had spent the morning picking and the afternoon boiling fruit. But Sandy was ahead of her mother. With flushing cheeks and eyes like stars, she had darted into the kitchen, where she and Lob were hugging one another <clears throat> in a frenzy of joy. About, pardon me. Something caught in the throat. Um, <clears throat> with flushed cheeks, and eyes like stars, she had darted into the kitchen, where she and Lob were hugging, one another in a frenzy of joy. About a yard of his tongue was out, and he was licking every part of her that he could reach. Good heavens, exclaimed Jean. How in the world did he get here? He must have walked, said Sandy. Look at his feet. They were worn, dusty, and tarry. One had a cut on the pad. They ought to be bathed, said Jean Pengelly. Sandy, run a bowl of warm water while I get the disinfectant. What'll we do about him, mother? said Sandy anxiously. Miss Pengelly, Mrs. Pengelly looked at her daughter's pleading eyes and sighed. He must go back to his owner, of course, she said, making her voice firm. Your dad, your dad can get the address from the fisherman's, from the fisherman's tomorrow and phone him and send a telegram. In the meantime, He'd better have a long drink and a good meal. Lob was very grateful for the drink and the meal and made no objection to having his feet washed. Then he flopped down on the hearth rug and slept in front of the fire they had lit because it was cold, wet evening and his head on Sandy's feet. He was, very, he was a very tired dog. He had walked all the way from Liverpool to Cornwall, which is more than 400 miles. The next day, Mr. Pengelly phoned Lob's owner, and the following morning, Mr. Dodsworth arrived off the, train, off the night train, decidedly put out, meaning he was upset, to take his pet home. That parting was worse than, than the first. 
Lob whined. Don walked out of the house. The twins burst out crying, and Sandy crept up to her bedroom afterward and lay with her face pressed into the quilt, feeling as if she were bruised all over. Jean Pingelli took them all into Plymouth to see the circus on the next day, and the twins cheered up a little. But even the hour's ride in the train each way and the Liberty Horses and performing seals could not cure Sandy's sore heart. She need not have bothered, though. In ten days' time, Lob was back, limping this time with a torn ear and a patch missing out of his furry coat, as if he had met and tangled with an enemy or two in the course of his 400-mile walk. So we're going to stop here at 140. And reread lines 20 through 34, 59 through 70, 102 through 110, 136 through 139, and 168 through 173. What is happening again and again? So to answer this question, you need to go on to the classroom page, bring up the actual reading, and find these spots and reread them yourself. Then you're going to answer number two. Make a prediction. Why might the author bring this up again and again, these events that happen here at this time? So pause the video here and bring up that PDF so you can answer number one and two. Then when you start the story back up again, after pausing, we'll complete it together. Welcome back. Bert Bengeli rang up Liverpool again. Mr. Dodsworth, when he, when he answered, sounded wary. He said, that dog has already cost me two days that I can't spare away from my work. Plus, endless time in police stations and drafting newspaper advertisements. I'm too old for these ups and downs. I think we'd better face the fact, Mr. Pingelli, that it's your family he wants to stay with. That is, if you want to have him. Bert Pingelli gulped. He was not a rich man, and Lob was a pedigree dog. Pedigree dog means um, ancestry that's known and recorded. They're more valuable. Um, he said cautiously, how much would you be asking for him? Good heavens, man, I'm not suggesting I'd sell him to you. You must have him as a gift. Think of the train fares I'll be saving. You'll be doing me a good turn. Is he a big eater? Bert asked doubtfully. By this time, the children, breathless in the background, listening to one side of this conversation, had realized what was in the wind and were dancing up and down with their hands clasped beseechingly. Oh, not for his size, Lob's owner, assured Bert. Two or three pounds of meat a day and some vegetables and gravy and biscuits. He does very well on that. Alexandra's father looked over the telephone at his daughter's swimming eyes and trembling lips. He reached a decision. Well, then, Mr. Dodsworth, he said briskly, we'll accept your offer and thank you very much. The children were, will be overjoyed and you can be sure Lob has come to a good home. They'll look after him and see he gets enough exercise. But I can tell you, he said firmly, if he wants to settle in with us, he'll have to learn to eat a lot of fish. So, that was how Lob came to live with the Pingelli family. Everybody loved him, and he loved them all. But there was never any question who came first with him. He was Sandy's dog. He slept by her bed and followed her everywhere he was allowed. Nine years went by, and each summer Mr. Dodsworth came back to stay at the Fisherman's Arms and call on his Eastwell dog, Lob. Uh, Lob always met him with recognition and dignified pleasure, accompanied him for a walk or two, but showed no signs of wishing to return to Liverpool. His place, he intimated, was definitely with the Pingellis. In the course of nine years, Lob changed less than Sandy. As he went into her teens, as she went into her teens, he became a little slower, a little stiffer. There was a touch of gray on his nose, but he was still a handsome dog. He and Sandy still loved one another devotedly. One evening in October, all the summer visitors had left, and the little fishing town 
looked empty and secretive. It was a wet, windy dusk. When the children came home from school, even the twins were at high school now, and Don was a full-fledged fisherman. Jean Pingelli said, Sandy, your Aunt Rebecca says she's lonesome because Uncle Will Hoskins has gone out, thro out trawling, and she wants one of you to go and spend the evening with her. You go, dear. You can take your homework with you. And trawling is fishing. Sandy looked far, looked far from enthusiastic. Can I take Lob with me? You know Aunt Becky doesn't really like dogs. Oh, very well, Mrs. Pengelly sighed. I suppose she'll have to put up with him as well as you. Reluctantly, Sandy tidied herself, took her school bag, put on the damp raincoat she had just taken off, fastened Lob's lead to his collar, and set off to walk through the dusk to Aunt Becky's cottage, which was five minutes' climb up the steep hill. We're going to stop here for a minute. Reread the sentence in lines 189 to 192. Why might the narrator be drawing your attention to this steep hill again? So reluctantly, San Sandy tidied herself, took her, school, took her school bag, put on the damp raincoat she had just taken off, fastened Lob's lead, lead to his collar, and set off to walk through the dusk to Aunt Becky's cottage, which was five minutes' climb up the steep hill. Remember, we talked about that hill earlier. The wind was howling through the shrouds of boats drawn up on the hard. But some, were, but some cheerful music on do, said Jean Pingelli to the nearest twin. Anything to drown that wretched sound while I make your dad's supper. So Don, who had just come in, put on some rock music loud, which was why the Pingellis did not hear the truck hurtle down the hill and crash against the post office wall a few minutes later. So let's reread 195 to 199. What might the description of the crash suggest? So the dad comes in, turns on loud rock music, which was why the Pingellis did not hear the truck hurtle down the hill and crash against the post office wall a few minutes later. What do you think happened? Dr. Travers was driving through Cornwall with his wife, taking a late holiday before patients began coming down with, cold, with winter colds and flu. He saw the sign that said steep hill, low gear, one and a half miles. Dutifully, he changed into second gear. He must be nearly, we must be nearly there, said his wife, looking out of her window. I noticed a sign on the coast road that said the Fisherman's Arms, which is a hotel, was two miles. What a narrow, dangerous hill. But the cottages are very pretty. Oh, Frank, stop! Stop! There's a child. I'm sure it's a child. By the wall, over there. Dr. Travers jammed on his brakes and brought the car to a stop. A little stream ran down by the road in a shallow stone culvert, and half in the water lay something that looked, in the dusk, like a pile of clothes. Or was it the body of a child? Mrs. Travers was out of the car in a flash, but her husband was quicker. Don't touch her, Emily, he said sharply. She's been hit. Can't be more than a few minutes. Remember that truck that overtook us half a mile back, speeding like the devil? Here, quick, go into the cottage and phone for an ambulance. The girl's in a bad way. I'll stay here and do what I can to stop the bleeding. Don't waste a minute. Doctors are, ex are experts Doctors are expert at stopping dangerous bleeding, for they know the right places to press. This Mr. Travers was able to do, was able to do, but he didn't dare do more. The girl was lying in a queerly crumpled heap, and he guessed she had a number of bones broken, and that it would be highly dangerous to move her. He watched her with great concentration, wondering where the truck had got to and other damage it had done. Mrs. Travers was very quick. She had seen plenty of accident cases and knew the importance of speed. The first cottage she tried had a phone. In four minutes she was back, and in six an ambulance was wailing down the hill. Its attendants lifted the child onto the stretcher as carefully as if she were made out of fine thistledown. The ambulance sped off to Plymouth for the local cottage 
hospital did not take serious accident cases, and Dr. Travers went down to the police station to report what he had done. He found the police already he found the police already knew about the speeding truck which had offered which had suffered from loss of brakes and ended up with its radiator halfway through the post office wall. The driver was concussed and shocked, but the police thought he was the only person injured until Dr. Travers told his tale. At half past nine that night, Aunt Rebecca Hoskins was sitting by her fire, thinking aggrieved, thinking aggrieved thoughts about the inconsiderateness of nieces who were asked to, asked to suffer and never turned up, when she was startled by a neighbor who burst in explain, exclaiming, Have you heard about Sandy Pingelli? Then, Mrs. Hoskins, terrible thing, poor little soul. And they don't know if she's likely to live. Police have got the truck driver that hit her. Ah, it didn't ought to be allowed, speeding through the place like that at umpteen miles an hour. They ought to jail him for life. Not that they'd be any comfort to poor Bert and Jean. Horrified, Aunt Rebecca put on her coat and went down to her brother's house. She found the family with white shocked faces. Bert and Jean were about to drive off to the hospital where Sandy had been taken, and the twins were crying bitterly. Lob was nowhere to be seen, but Aunt Rebecca was not interested in dogs. She did not inquire about him. What do you think? I'm going to reread this, but Aunt Rebecca was not interested in dogs. She did not inquire about him, meaning they don't know where Lob is. Thank the Lord you've come back, said her brother. Will you stay the night with Don and the twins? Don's out looking for Lob, and heaven knows when we'll be back. We may get a bed with Jean's mother in Plymouth. Oh, if only I never invited the poor child, wailed Mrs. Hopkins, Hoskins, but Bert and Jean hardly heard her. That night seemed to last forever. The twins cried themselves to sleep. Don came home very late and grim faced. Bert and Jean sat in the waiting room of the Western Count County's hospital, but Sandy was unconscious. They were told, and she remained so. All that could be done for her was done. She was given transfusions to replace all the blood she had lost. The broken bones were set and put in slings and cradles. Is she a healthy girl? Has she a good constitution? The emergency doctor asked. Aye, doctor, she is that, Bert said hoarsely. The lump in Jean's throat prevented her from answering. She merely nodded. Then she ought to have a chance, but I won't conceal from you that her condition is very serious unless she shows signs of coming out from this coma. But as our, as our seceded hour, Sandy showed no signs of recovering consciousness. Her parents said in the waiting room with haggard faces, sometimes one of them would go to the telephone, the family at home, or two try to get a little sleep at their home of Granny Pierce, not far away. At noon, next day, Dr. and Mrs. Traverse went to the Pingali cottage to inquire how Sandy was doing, but the report was gloomy, still in a very serious condition. The twins were miserably unhappy. They forgotten that they had sometime called their elder sister bossy and only remembered how often she had shared her pocket money with them, how she read to them and took them for picnics and helped with their homework. Now there was no Sandy, no mother and dad. Don went around with a gray, shuttered face and were still. There was no lob. The Western County's hospital is a large one, with dozens of different departments and five or six connected buildings, each with three or four entrances. By the afternoon, it became noticeable that a dog seemed to be taken to positions outside the hospital with the fixed intention of getting in. Patiently, he would try first one entrance and then another, all the way around and then begin again. Sometimes he would get a little way inside following the visitor, but animals were, of course, forbidden, and he was always kindly but firmly turned out again. Sometimes the guard at the main entrance gave him a pat or offered him a bit of sandwich. He looked so wet and beseeching and desperate, but he never ate the sandwich. No one seemed to own him and know where he came from. Plymouth is a large city, and he might have belonged to anybody. At tea time, Granny Pierce came through the pouring rain to bring a flask of hot tea 
to her daughter and son-in-law. Just as she reached the main entrance, the guard was, was gently but forcibly shoving out a large, agitated, soaking wet Alsatian dog. No, old fellow, you cannot come in. Hospitals are for people, not for dogs. Why, bless me, explained Mrs. Pierce. That's Lob. Her, here, Lob, Lobby boy. Lob ran to her, whining. Mrs. Pierce walked up to the desk. I'm sorry, madam. You can't bring that dog in here, the guard said. Mrs. Pierce was very determined, old lady. She looked the porter in the eye. Now, see here, young man. That dog has walked 20 miles from St. Killen to get to my granddaughter. Heaven knows how he knew she was here, but it's plain he knows, and he ought to have his rights. He ought to get to see her. Do you know, she went on bristling, that dog has walked the length of England twice to be with that girl, and you think that you think you can keep him out with your fiddling rules and regulations? I'll have to ask the medical officer, the guard said weakly. You do that, young man, Granny Pierce sat down, determined in a determined manner, shutting her umbrella, and Lob sat patiently dripping at her feet. Every now and then he shook his head as if to dislodge something heavy that was tied around his neck. Presently, a tired, thin, Intelligent-looking man in a white collar came downstairs with an impressive silver-haired man in a dark suit. There was a low voice discussion. Granny Pierce eyed them, binding her time. Frankly, not much to lose, said the older man. The man in the white coat approached Granny Pierce. It's strictly against every rule, but it's such a serious case we are making an exception, he said to her quietly, but only outside her bedroom door, and only for a moment or two. Without a word, Granny Pierce rose and, stump, and stumped upstairs. Lob followed close to her skirts, as if he knew his hope lay with her. They waited in the green-floored corridor outside Sandy's room. The door was half shut. Bert and Jean were inside. Everything was terribly quiet. A nurse came out. The white-coat man asked her something, and she shook her head. She had left the door ajar, and through it could now be seen a high, narrow bed with a lot of gadgets around it. Sandy lay there, very flat under the covers, very still. Her head was turned away. All Lob's attention was riveted on the bed. He strained toward it, but Granny Pierce clasped his collar firmly. I've done a lot for you, my boy. Now you behave yourself, she whispered grimly. Lob let out a faint whine, anxious and pleading. At the sound of that whine, Sandy stirred just a little. She sighed and moved her head the least fraction. Lob whined again, and then Sandy turned her head right over, her eyes opened, looking at the door. Lob, she murmured, no more than a breath of sound. Lobby boy? The doctor by Granny Pierce drew a quick, sharp breath. Sandy moved her arm, her left arm, the one that was not broken, from below the covers and let her hand dangle down, feeling, as she always did in the mornings, for Lob's furry head. The doctor nodded slowly. All right, he whispered. Let him go to the bedside, but keep a hold of him. Granny Pearson Lobb moved to the bedside. Now she could see Bert and Jean, white-faced and shocked, on the far side of the bed, but she didn't look at them. She looked at the smile on the granddaughter's she looked at the smile on her granddaughter's face as the groping fingers found Lobb's wet ears and gently pulled them. Good boy, whispered Sandy, and fell asleep again. Granny Pierce led Lob out into the passage again. There she let go of him, and he ran out off swiftly down the stairs. She would have followed him, but Bert and Jean had come out into the passage, and she spoke to Bert fiercely. I don't know why you were so foolish as to not bring the dog before, leaving him to find the way here himself. But mother, said Jean Pengelly, that can't have been Lob. What a chance to take. Suppose Sandy hadn't, she stopped with her handkerchief, pressed to her mouth. Not Lob? I've known that dog nine years. I suppose I ought to know my own granddaughter's dog. Listen, mother, said Bert. Lob was killed by the same truck that hit Sandy. Don found him. When he went to look for Sandy's school bag, he was... he was dead. Ribs all smashed, no question of that. Don told me on the phone. 
He and Will Hoskins rode a half mile out to sea and sank the dog with a lump of concrete tied to his collar. Poor old boy. Still, he was getting on. Couldn't have lasted forever. Sank him at sea? Then what? Slowly, old Miss Pierce and then the other two turned to look at the trail of dripping wet footprints that led down the hospital stairs. In the Pingelli's garden, they have a stone under the palm tree. It says, Lob, Sandy's dog, buried at sea. Okay, now you're going to pull up the story a number of times, so you'll need to have the classroom page open, but you're going to, because you're going to have to reread lines 274 to 302, what happened again in those lines, and why was this or why is this shocking or unexpected? Then you're going to need to think critically. Why might the author bring this behavior up again and again, or what lesson or quality does the reader learn from what happens again and again? After you've answered these, they're going to answer these questions on the back of the page. Recall, what causes the accident that injures Sandy? Number five, clarify. Where does Mr. Dodsworth live? Why is this important to the story? Six, summarize. How does Lobb's again and again behavior show his loyalty towards Sandy? Seven, reread lines 51 to 56. So you got to open up the PDF on the classroom post. What does the information in these lines foreshadow? And remember, foreshadow is a hint about something that will happen later in the story to build excitement. Number eight, reread lines 289 to 282 and lines 315 to 316. What does the information in these lines suggest? So open up the PDF and reread both these lines. Finally, what do you think happens at the end of Lob's Girl? Answer all these questions. When you are finished answering these questions, then come up to Mr. Mendez, or there will be somewhere in the room the quiz. It's short that you need to take when you're all, when it all is said and done. All right. Thank you for watching.